Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. In this week's study, we're going to see that Yeshua, that is Jesus of Nazareth, he spoke in very clear words about one individual. And that individual was John the Baptist. And what did Messiah say about him? He said, of those born of women, that is, in a natural way, no one is greater than John the Baptist. And we need to ask ourselves, why did Yeshua say those words in regard to John? What was going on with John at that time? And not only what was going on, but where was he when all of this was taking place? Well, to be able to answer those questions, to get your Bible and look with me to the book of Matthew and chapter 11. The book of Matthew and chapter 11. Now, it begins with a transition. We're leaving one time, one happening, and moving into something different. And that's why we read in verse 1 of our text, And it came about when Yeshua completed instructing or commanding his 12 disciples that he departed from there and he taught and proclaimed in their cities. So he's continuing his ministry, a very important point. So as he is progressing, being faithful to why he was sent into this world, that is to instruct, to teach, and to proclaim. And usually that word proclamation is in regard to things related to the kingdom of God. And then notice what happens in the next verse, verse 2. But John, having heard in prison the works of Messiah. Now, the context is clear. Where is John? John is in prison. And the question that has to be asked is this. What caused him to be in prison? What did he do? And there's no debate about it. We all know. There was a leader, and he wanted to marry his, his brother's former wife. And this is forbidden in the Torah. The law of God will not permit this. Now, all the other leaders were willing to, to concede, to compromise, but a true man of God, a true woman of God, does not compromise on the integrity of God's word. This word is truth. So John wouldn't sanction that marriage. He stood up for Torah truth, and what happened? It got him sent to prison, and eventually he was put to death, all because of the same issue. So John is in the midst of prison. And while he's there, he hears things. What does he hear? He hears about the work of Messiah. And it's in the plural, so the deeds, what Messiah has been doing. And therefore, John, having heard these things, and we know something. The scripture tells us, and faith comes by hearing. And John is hearing what Messiah is doing. He's hearing the proclamations that Messiah is making, this instruction, this announcement concerning the kingdom of God. And therefore, John has a question. What is that question? Again, look at the text. We're in the end of, of verse, verse 2. We read, And he sent two of his disciples. So John, he sends two disciples. Now, numbers are important in the scripture. Usually the number two speaks about a dichotomy, that is, a difference. Two different 
opinions. And that's why John is sending his disciples, his two disciples, to Yeshua to get an answer concerning two possibilities to know for sure what is the right way of thinking. And this is great advice for us. We want to be people who know the right way of thinking. So he sends these two disciples of his, and he said to him, now this is the disciples speaking, but it's as though John from prison is addressing Yeshua. So he says to him, are you the one who is coming? Meaning, are you Messiah ben David? Or should we another expect? Now, this is a very important passage, and most scholars get it wrong. Many people, and check out the commentators, they will tell you this. Well, John is in, in prison, and it's hard there, and John is, is having a crisis of faith. No, he's not. You may have a crisis of faith. I hope you don't. I may have a crisis of faith. I hope I don't. But John did not. That is someone who has not understood this passage who would make such an insultive and also ripping things out of their context because in a few minutes, we already know what Yeshua is going to say. He's going to say, of those born of women, no one's greater than John. And is he praising John because of some crises of faith? No, he is not. John understands something. See, John knew that the Messiah was Yeshua. But remember what we have come across in Judaism. At that time, they were teaching there's two Messiahs because when you look at prophecy, there's two descriptions of Messiah. There is the Messiah, that suffering servant. And there is the Messiah, that ruling king, the son of David. So when John the Baptist, when he says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, he knew who he was speaking about. Messiah, the son of Joseph, that suffering servant who was going to be like a sacrificial lamb and lay down his life and shed his blood for redemption. But what do we read here? We read that John is, is not having a crisis of faith. John is discerning something. He is discerning that what he has been taught by the leaders is incorrect. John is thinking there might not be two messiahs, but only one Messiah who has two very distinct but related works coming to pay the price as that suffering servant for your sin and mine and then returning at the end of the age in order to be indeed that victorious soldier, that, that righteous king that establishes his kingdom. So this is the nature of his question. And when he says here, or should we expect another, pay attention to that word other. You know, there's two different Greek words for another or an other one. Now, one is the word alos, the other word is eteros. Alos means of the same type. Eteros, the word that's here, speaks of one of a different type. So he understands that, that there's two different works, suffering and bringing victory over the enemies. Two very different things. And his question is, is there another one who's going to do this or are you the one and only? Based upon what? What does the text say? Based upon what he has heard Messiah doing, what he has heard concerning Messiah's teaching. So John is not having a crisis of faith. John is discerning the truth that Yeshua is indeed the Lamb of God. He wasn't questioning that. He wasn't removing himself from that concept. But he was coming to the right conclusion that this Lamb of God is also that line of Judah, that there's one. So he asks, should, should we expect another one? Now look at verse 4. And Yeshua answered and said to him. Now, he's saying, directing it to John, 
what he's telling these two disciples of, of John. Go and proclaim to John what you hear and what you see. And what is that? Blind, they regain their sight, they see. The lame, they're walking. Lepers, those with leprosy, they are being cleansed. And the deaf, they hear. And the dead, they are being raised. And the poor, these are the afflicted ones. They are being evangelized. Now, that's what it literally means. And what is that? They are being given good news. This word poor, later on, and earlier we see in Matthew 5, for example, but also later on, it's used to detect those who are poor in spirit, meaning afflicted inwardly because they're not seeing this, this hope being fulfilled, prophetic hope. And Messiah came just to do that, to evangelize the fulfillment of the prophetic promises of God. They are at hand because Yeshua, Jesus of Nazareth, the Christ, he is with us. That's what he's saying to, to these individuals. Now, verse 6. And, and happy or blessed, this is that same word for the Beatitudes, happy or blessed is whoever. It means it's an invitation. Whomsoever that is not offended, this is the word that we get the English word, scandal from. That no one would be scandalized by him. Being offended, why? Well, even though that he's that son of David, he's the king of kings and the Lord of lords, what's going to happen? He's going to be rejected. He's going to be mocked. He's going to be betrayed. He's going to be humiliated and shamed when they flog him, when they spit upon him, when they strike him, and ultimately when they nail nails into his palms and into his ankle. All of this humiliation don't let it offend you because he is indeed the son of God. And it's the resurrection that announces that, confirms it, shows God's sanction upon Yeshua as the Lamb of God and that Lord of Lords, that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess to the glory of God that Yeshua, that he is Lord. So here in our text, he says about these individuals, happy are the ones who are not offended in me or by me, verse 7. And these, these two disciples, they go, and after they had left, notice what it says, and Yeshua began to speak to the crowds, not just one crowd, but as I've said several times, there are numerous crowds following him. And what's the significance of that? Why put it in the plural to teach us that the gospel message penetrates not just one community. It's not a message for, for these type of Jews, but not the other. Or just for the Jewish people, and not the Gentiles. No, there are many different groups, crowds of people from different cultures, different backgrounds, different races, different nationalities. But his message is for all people. So he began to speak to the crowds concerning John, and he asked a question. He says, why did you go out into the desert? For what purpose? What did you want to see? And this word see is one for perceiving. It's just not seeing something with your eyes, but it's also understanding something with your mind, having a right, right concept. Understanding the significance of an event or a happening. So he says, why did you go out into the, the desert? What did you go there to see? And he gives a suggestion. A reed by the wind which is shaken. Now, in that area, this is a normal occurrence. There are reeds there and the wind blows them. It's natural. It's common. He said, you didn't go out to the desert to hear John's proclamation, to submit to his call to repentance because of some normal occurrence. You understand, did you not, that something significant is going on here? And if you have a prophetic perspective, you knew the timing 
Messiah came, not just any time, he came at the right time prophetically. All of this is so important to see. So he says, why did you go out into the, the, the desert? For what purpose did you go there for? Was it to see a, a reed shaken by the wind? Is that why you went out? He asks again. But why did you go out to see individuals dressed in fine clothes? No, he says, for those individuals, behold, those who are bearing fine clothes, they're in the houses. This would be a palace, but it's simply the normal word for a house. The houses of kings. So he says again, but why did you go out? And here's the right answer. The next word, what an important word. The word prophet. They recognize that John was a prophet by his self-denial. That he did not live like normal people. He lived like one who was under the authority of God and who had an expectation, who perceived the significance of those days, who knew who Messiah is. So he says, no, you went out. Why? You went out for a prophet. Yes, I say to you, not just a prophet, but more than a prophet. Verse 10. For this is the one by which it has been written. Behold, I am sending my messenger. Now, this messenger is important because there's a few passages from Isaiah 40 and from the book of Malachi that speak to a messenger. And in this case, and it has, uh, some say, two fulfillments to it. Now, Isaiah is clearly speaking about Elijah the prophet. And there's passages in Malachi that as well, so we'll interpret it this way. It's a reference to Elijah going before and getting things in order, and that's going to happen. But there was also the spirit of Elijah upon this one, John the Baptist, who fulfilled the role of Elijah. And that's why he says, Behold, I send, he's quoting scripture, and this tells us how frequently when we look at the new covenant, we see how it's always based. In order to understand the New Testament, you have to understand prophetic revelation. How frequently the prophets, the words of the prophets appear in the Gospels. And it's not by chance. It's so that we can arrive at the right understanding. So he says, Behold, I send forth my messenger before you. Now this is John going before Messiah, the Savior. Who, what will he do? It says, who will prepare the way, your way before you. He's the one that's going to prepare the people by what? Well, it's for the ministry of Messiah. And what was John's call? What did he do? He was one who called the people to repentance. And that's why. If there is a, a preacher and he is not speaking frequently about the need for repentance, he's not fulfilling his call. He is not someone. And when someone says, you know, I just, I just don't feel call to, to, to speak repentance, to call people to bring conviction, to speak about God as condemning. Well, if they don't feel this way, they need to get out of this call to stop masquerading as something that they're not. Everyone who holds this book and says, I'm a teacher of this word of God, they are going to emphasize, make no mistake about it, they are going to emphasize repentance. So we see here that he's going to be the one that prepares the way before you, that is before Messiah. Verse 11. Amen. That's the word truly, how it's understood. Amen. I say to you, or truly I say to you, that there is not one who has risen up among born of women. So there's not been one who has been raised up, born of women, and that simply means in a natural way. One greater than who? One greater than John the Baptist. 
Now, why that term Baptist? There's two reasons. Now, some will simply tell you because John had a call, a ministry to bring the baptism of repentance. That's exactly right. That's true. But realize another important truth, and that's this. What baptism speaks of. And one very important aspect of baptism is attesting one's faith in what? The death, burial, and resurrection of Messiah. What we see is that Messiah himself spoke about his ministry as a baptism in the Gospel of Luke in chapter 12. He says, I have a baptism to undergo and how distressed I am until it's completed. Now, he had been baptized in the Jordan River three years prior to that. He wasn't speaking about baptism in a water baptism sense, but he was speaking about what water baptism signifies, and that is the death. What do you do with dead people? You bury them. You go underneath the water, buried in water. And what happened to Messiah? He just didn't die, and he just wasn't buried, but on the third day he rose again. And that's why John is called John the Baptist, not just because of his call to repentance through baptism, but what baptism signifies, he pointed to the ministry of Messiah, his death, burial, and resurrection. So he says here, I want to read it again. Look at verse 11. Truly I say to you, one has not risen, born of women, greater than John the Baptist, but as great as he was, it says this one is small, least, in the kingdom of heaven. Why? Well, you can do great actions, deeds. You can obey God's word perfectly. But if you haven't experienced redemption, you won't be in the kingdom. So John, he was faithful. He was the most faithful of any human being other than Messiah himself. And Messiah is fully man and fully God. But nevertheless, the one who's least in the kingdom of God is greater than John. Why? He's experienced Messiah's redemption. So as great as John is, we read here in this, this passage, but least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than him. Verse 12. Now, verse 12 is where we're going to speak more about the kingdom of God. Over and over and over in the scripture, we see Messiah. He spoke, he emphasized, he's taught about the kingdom of God. So here, but from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven, and there's a very important word. This word is a word for, for intensity. Now, many Bibles will translate it as, as violence. But I would argue that violent is not the way that we should think of it as in the sense of someone being violent to, to someone else. But it's a word of intensity. It is a word of commitment to act and behave in a certain way. What way? In order to fulfill the objective. So someone who is passionate, someone who is committed to an objective, someone that acts because they realize if they don't act now, that moment will be lost. So that's what this word is speaking of. So he says, from the time of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven, it is something that people were interested in. And people were acting in a committed way, some for it, some against it. There's great opposition. And John had experienced that opposition, had he not? You say, what am I talking about? He was in prison. And then shortly after this, we know something else. We know, when I say shortly after, what we know is that after John sent these words inquiring, he didn't live much longer because John, we know, was beheaded for his faith because of his commitment to Torah law. The commandments of God in regard to marriage. See, many people don't know this. John was put to death. Why? Because of a commitment to marital truth. And then he says, 
and with intensity. The same word that's often translated violent, he says with intensity, with commitment for a purpose. What happens? It will be, and this next word is the same word that's used elsewhere in the New Testament. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17, for the rapture. It has to do with someone snatching something, taking something by force with a purpose, with great intensity. That's what Messiah is going to do for the body of believers, so for true disciples. He's going to snatch us away. He's going to take hold of us for a purpose. And that's what this word is speaking about. So notice that this word, arpazo, the word for rapture, in the New Testament, is used here in regard to the kingdom of God. There's no kingdom of God in experience unless Messiah committedly, in, with intensity, with a purpose, snatches us away. Verse 13, for all the prophets and the law were until John, they prophesied. There's prophecy in the law as well, meaning the law and the prophets gave information concerning the kingdom of God. He says, now, now, until John, all the message of the scripture, both the law and the prophets spoke concerning the kingdom of God. And he says, and if you will be willing to receive it, this one, speaking of John, is who is Elijah, that one who was supposed to come. And how does he end? Well, after revealing that John came and ministered, how? In the spirit of Elijah. Elijah the prophet, his anointing was upon John the Baptist. That's what he's saying. It points to the fact that Yeshua was saying, yes, I am the Messiah. And then how does he end? With a very important verse that speaks specifically to the congregation of redeemed, the church, he says. The one having ears, let him hear, hear the truth of God. And that word hear just doesn't mean, well, I heard it, and so what? But it's a word of, again, commitment, intensity, faithfulness, action. It's to hear something, and if you truly have understood it, you are going to respond in a specific manner. That which that word demands important truth from God's word. Well, I'm out of time until next week. Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.